Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, we, we give you all of our praise because you and you alone are worthy. You are the perfect, righteous one, holy, almighty. God, you know, I look out at the, at the universe that you created and how beautiful and majestic it is. It's just a picture, just a tiny little picture of your majesty and your greatness. And not only is what, you're, what you created, us included, so special and wonderful, God, but what you've done for us is so amazing. God, you're such a good God that you would die for such people like us. God, that you would take us out of our, out of our darkness while we owed such a great debt as we just sung about. And you would take that debt on yourself. God, thank you so much for that. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. And uh, at this time, we want to carry on in the, in the spirit of prayer. And so uh, every service, we, we devote a, a small portion of our worship service to individual or small group prayer. And so we want to offer this time for you all to use however it is that you need to use it. Um, if, if you want to take this time to worship God, continue in, in praise to God in your heart, uh, then, then do that. If, if it's confession, if it's thanksgiving, um, whatever you want or need to do. If you want to just take some time by yourself, then that's fine. If you want to look around at your neighbors and say, hey, would you pray with me? I could use some prayer today. Or if you'd like to, to pray with me, I'd be happy to receive you up front here. We can go off to the side and pray together. Uh, whatever it is you need, take this time and, and pray. So about for five minutes, let's pray.
Lord God, we thank you for this five minutes of time that we set aside every Sunday to just be able to pray to you, to talk to you, Lord. And we know that as we pray to you that you also talk back to us, Lord. So we ask that you open our ears and open our eyes, Lord, so that we can see and hear you better. Lord, we ask that you align our hearts with you. And we ask you, Lord, uh, just to continue to surround us and be with us, Lord, as we seek you more. We ask for forgiveness of those sins, Lord, that we that we commit. We know that we commit sins, Lord. We ask you just for forgiveness of those and just look to you, Lord. Look to your, your mercy and your grace, Lord. And we thank you that you are a loving Father and that we can look to you for everything. So we lift up every prayer request to you, Lord, and just look to you through it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we have a couple of quick announcements this morning. Uh, first one, they're both for this coming Saturday. So Saturday, October 26th, we have our work day at 9 o'clock a.m. So if you're like, I would love to see how I can help out at Wheatland Community Church, this is an opportunity for you. So come on out to the church. Uh, we have just some fall cleanup stuff, some things that need to be done around the church to make it look a little bit nicer. So if you're able to come out for an hour, for two hours, three hours, Sean will put you to work. So if you want to stay all day, you can stay all day too. So, uh, And then also along with that Saturday, next Saturday is our mission trip. We are so excited that we are going to be leaving to Costa Rica on Saturday. And we want to invite the whole church. Any single one of you can come out. We're going to meet here at 7 o'clock from about 7 until 7.30. Uh, we'd love to have you guys pray with us, send us off, and uh, just give us a pat on the back and look forward to that. So uh, we will be leaving Saturday morning about 9.45, getting down to Costa Rica about 9 o'clock at night, and then we'll be there for the whole week, and we'll come back the following Sunday. So we'd love to have you guys come out and pray with us on Saturday. Uh, so that being said, let's look at our scripture for today. We're, we are in 1 Corinthians 12. It's a long passage today, so you're going to have to deal with me as I read this. I might need my water break as well. So we're going to read verses 12 and 13 this morning. For just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many, are one body, so also is Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. This is the word of the Lord. Junior Church, you may be dismissed as Kevin commands up. Thanks, Josh. All right. Got to bring this thing up here. All right, you know, let's take a moment and continue in, in a spirit of prayer. And specifically, let's pray for the worship team. That uh, Worship team. Yeah, we should pray for the worship team, the mission trip team <laughs> that's going to Costa Rica. Um, you know, and uh, it's it, somewhat of a commissioning, right? I mean, this is a uh, let us, let's pray that God uses this team uh, as we go, that, uh, that the gospel would go forth, that uh, God would be glorified, and that lives would be changed. That's our heartbeat. That's, those are the prayers, right? And so um, we covet your prayers for us during that week. And uh, technically eight days that will be gone. And so uh, we uh, look forward to then reporting back on November 10th uh, all about the trip. And so you'll uh, want to invite you, of course, to services every week. But uh, uh, November 10th we'll share. So while, we're, while Josh and I are away and, and the team, uh, there will be um, uh, Mark's going to be preaching next Sunday uh, from John chapter 4. So that'll be great. Looking forward to, to seeing that probably either the next day or later that day or something like that, when I can find some time to watch that. And then Aaron Howard the uh, next week uh, preaching. So looking forward to these two other elders to be able to pray. And we're so glad that God has blessed us with, with godly men who have uh, stepped up to the role of elder to lead this church, along with Josh and I. It's also Mark and Aaron, Eric and Dan. And so we just praise God for these guys who are praying for you often. Uh, every day, our goal is, Monday through Saturday, is to pray for each one of you by name. That's our heart's desire and our goal. And so we want to pray for you. We want to hear from you, um, you know, and, and how we can continue to pray. Uh, so let's pray specifically uh, for the, the trip and for the, 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 the message of God's word today to, to get into our hearts. Let's unite our hearts together. 
Uh, God, thank you again for this time where we can worship you. Thank you for gathering us together in the name of Jesus Christ, through the unity that we have through the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, We give you praise. We also are so thankful for how you have not only saved us from our sin, but now you've called us to be ambassadors, to be lights. And, and each one of us has that responsibility, God, and we thank you for that because it's good. You know, everything that comes from you is good. And so every part of your word is good, and we want to walk in obedience to it. So God, as we each seek to apply what that looks like in our, in our daily walk with you, in our uh, relationships towards those who are outside of the church, as we seek to testify to, to your gospel, may all of us this week and next week, and specifically the team that's going to Costa Rica, Lord, that, but, but for all of us, that we would seek to proclaim you faithfully, both in word and in deed, that you might be glorified, God. I just pray that all glory would be given to you, that we wouldn't seek our own reputation, that we wouldn't seek any sort of glory or any sort of recognition, but that it would all be for your glory. And that, that people would be drawn into relationship with you uh, through the testimony of your word, through the testimony of lives that have been changed by the gospel. And so, God, may you be honored in these ways. We commit this to you. We specifically want to commit and commission this team of, uh, of 11 of us who are going. We ask for your blessing as we go. Again, Lord, that, that through every point of contact with people, that we would be a light in the darkness, God, that, that you would speak forth and that you would be honored. That's our heart's desire, God. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so uh, this week we are, are talking about, we're picking up where we left off two weeks ago uh, when we talked about the ordinance of the church. And some of you are wondering, like, Kevin, I thought we were going to have a baptism. Where's the baptismal? Um, our, our, the young man that was going to be baptized today uh, had, a, had a death in the family, and it was really really challenging for him. So, so be praying for uh, uh, Anthony, the, the young man who was going to be baptized. He, he's taken it very, very hard. But um, uh, just, you know, let, let's support him in prayer. Let's uh, encourage him as, uh, as he kind of processes some things. And, and so hopefully, you know, through, uh, through some time and whatnot and more counsel, we'll, um, you know, r- look at, look at the, the idea of baptism again for him. Uh, but that being said, want to encourage you, uh, we do have uh, a baptismal ready to go at any time, so anyone who is ever wanting or ready to be baptized, just let us know, and we're happy to, Josh, today? Yeah, I mean, again, I mean, I don't know, I don't know, I, we don't have second, second baptisms, but I mean, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, but just let us know, because we want to, we want to make sure that we follow God's word in that way. Um, the church has historically recognized two primary ordinances, clear, very clear ordinances in the church. And the first one that we did uh, a couple weeks ago, which was uh, communion or the Lord's Supper, we, we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And so today we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 because Paul is, is dealing with a theme there that we'll, we'll get into. But the ordinance of the church, and these are specific commands, the ordinances. Why do we use this term ordinances? These are specific commands that Jesus Christ gave to the whole church that we are to do together. And so that's, that's why we want to talk about it, because it's very significant. So we're going to jump right in, and what we're going to do, here's where we're going today. It's just a simple outline. Uh, point number one is the purpose and meaning of baptism. And for that, we're especially going to look at Romans chapter 6. I love Romans chapter 6 in so many ways. But whenever I think of baptism, my mind, my brain just goes, boom, Romans chapter 6. It's such a beautiful picture of the meaning and the purpose of baptism. So we're going to look at that. And then secondly, we're going to look at the corporate effect of baptism. And and first of all, as we think about these two dynamics that we're going to look at today, I want us to go back to two weeks ago and just briefly refresh our minds in the primary purposes of communion, the Lord's Supper. What, what's the purpose of the Lord's Supper? Why do we take juice and bread and, and do the whole thing? Like, why do we do that? And, and there's, there's three purposes of it. First, it says that do, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. We have to remember the gospel. And I'll explain what that word gospel means in just a minute. Secondly, it's a proclamation of the gospel. Paul said that every time you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. 
So we proclaim the gospel when we, when we participate, when we, when we hold the bread in our hands and in the, in the cup of juice, and we participate in that. We are proclaiming the truth of what Jesus Christ established for us. And then lastly, we are to apply the gospel. If you remember, that section in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 was all about how he bookended the section by saying, look, you're, 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 you're not doing this well. You're not doing this well, so here's how you should do it, right? He's saying, there is division among you. There's fighting. You're thinking about yourself before others. When you come to the communion table, when you come to share a meal together, you're just, you're eating first, and you're not thinking about the other person before yourself. And so you're wrapped up in your own self, and you're not thinking of the other person. And so we talked about how the gospel needs to be applied. Part of the purpose of communion, the Lord's Supper, and baptism, as we're going to see, is that we have to apply the effects of, and the truth of the gospel in life together. And so there's an individual dynamic to the ordinances, but then there's also a corporate dynamic to these. So what is the gospel? I think it's really important for us just to, because we're going to take this, this model and apply it to baptism, as we're going to see from the texts. So what is the gospel? I think it's really important for us to identify this. And some of you are like, oh, Kevin, surely we know the gospel by now. The gospel is something that people out there need, right? The church doesn't need to talk about the gospel. We need to talk about how we can, you know, live for Jesus and all that. The church needs the gospel, I would say, just as much, if not more, right, than we need to give the gospel out to the world. We need the gospel because why? Because we forget it, don't we, church? I forget the gospel. I'm a pastor. I forget the gospel sometimes if I'm not careful, I've got to be on it every single day, refreshing my mind, reminding myself of the beautiful truth of what Jesus Christ did for me. Because church, if we don't, what's the, what's the alternative? What's going to speak if the gospel doesn't speak? My sinful heart is going to speak. The world is going to speak. If the gospel doesn't, allow, if, if I don't allow the gospel to take root in my life, to say, okay, everything I do must be filtered through the gospel. I'm not going to do that perfectly. That's why they call it spiritual growth. That's why we call this process that we're all in is the church sanctification. We are growing in it. And as we do that, we learn more and more. We get closer and closer to Christ-likeness, hopefully. That's the goal. That's the idea. But we need the gospel, church, and this is what it is. There, there's a lot of different ways to, to package the gospel. Here's a way, and, uh, and this is what I, how I like to think of the gospel from the scriptures. It starts in Genesis chapter 1. God created all things, and everything was very good, especially mankind. When God created mankind, he said, that's very good, right? God created, and what he creates is beautiful. It's good. It's right. It's true. It's perfect. Of course, the problem was that when given the opportunity, given free will, free choice, we go and we mess it up, <laughs> right? That's what happened. We see if we continue the story in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve, they're having a great time enjoying relationship with God, enjoying his garden that he created. It was beautiful. It was perfect. Everything was going great. And then God said, just, just one thing, just don't eat from that tree. And then, of course, you know, through the temptation of the serpent, Satan, Eve grabs it. Here you go, Adam. Okay, sure. And they disobey God. And at, the, at that moment, at that moment, death, amen, at that moment, death comes into the, into the world, right? That's exactly, it's, it's, uh, it's the, the crying, it's the effect of sin, and they, they felt their shame. We sung about shame today. They felt the shame of their sin before God. And they hid. Right? And that's what sin does. The, the, the work of sin is death. And everything that sin produces in us is wrong. We have this beautiful image of God. Each of you are so beautifully and wonderfully made by God. That's how he sees you. But he also sees that part of you when you said, I don't want anything to do with you, God. I don't think that you're actually good. I think my way is better. That's essentially what we say to God. That, that's what sin is. It's saying, I don't need you, God. I think my way is better. I'm going to try to maybe do some of what you said, but I'm not really going to do it all because I don't trust you. And so we've sinned, all of us. And Romans chapter 3 tells us that all have sinned 
and all fall short of God's perfect standard. And then it says there's not even one person. There's not even one person that's righteous. And then also in Romans chapter 5, this is a really, a really um, challenging verse. It's a helpful verse. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death spread to all people because all have sinned. So there's none of us that can avoid the effects of sin. So God creates, it's perfect, it's beautiful, it's good, we've all sinned. What are we going to do? Because we deserve death, we deserve condemnation, we deserve judgment. This is what God does. God is so good, he's so loving, he still sees you as his beautiful creations. He sees you as so wonderful and, and amazing. He loves you so much, and yet he's so grieved by your sin. He's like, what do I do here? God wasn't actually thinking because he knew exactly what he was going to do even before he created because he knew that we were going to sin. He said, I, I'm going to be their redeemer. I am going to be the one to help them out of their mess because they can't help themselves. And so Jesus was willing to, to sacrifice his life for you and for me, for all who would call upon his name. And that's the fourth thing. Call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. It's a promise. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. It's as simple as that, church. It, it, it's, it's, it, there's nothing that you do. There's nothing that you have to earn. You don't work your way up to salvation. You don't work your way up to God. He comes down to you, meets you in your filth, meets me in my filth, and he says, here, let me, let me, let me pull you up. I will pay the price of your sin. And not only that, not only am I going to wash you, I'm going to adopt you into my family. And I'm going to give you all all of the riches of heaven, all of the inheritance of Jesus Christ himself, God himself, you have. Church, you get that for free. You don't have to do anything. God just gives it to you. All you do is say, oh God, I believe in you. I trust in you. Thank you for giving this to me. I mean, that is just so amazing, church. That's what we proclaim. That's what we remember when we come to these ordinances, church. When we come to the Lord's table at once a month, when we come to a baptism, we remember these things and we allow them to take root in our hearts and then they, they work out in application. And so let's jump into specifically baptism. What's the primary purposes and meaning of baptism? And we see it in, in Romans chapter 6. Let's look at Romans chapter 6 verses 3 and 4. Now, I, I would like to take the 10 minutes that it needs to establish the whole context of where we're at in the book of Romans here, but um, we kind of already did. He's talking about the gospel in the book of Romans. And so he's at that place now in chapter 6 where he's saying, okay, we're all sinners, but Jesus Christ offers redemption, so now what do we do, <laughs> right? And so this is what he said, because he starts out the chapter, verse 1, saying, well, what should we say? Should we just continue in sin so that grace can abound, so grace can multiply, in other words, should, should I just not care about my sin because God's grace covers it anyways? And I can just be like, oh yeah, I am such a sinner. I just keep sinning. Whoops. But God forgives me. Should that be our attitude? And he says, God forbid. Absolutely not. How can we who died still live in it? How can we who we died to sin, how do we still live in it? And now this is where he picks up in verse 3. Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. I think the picture of baptism is so powerful. It is so beautiful, and I want to encourage you, especially as we go through this, to remember your baptism. 
And if you're not baptized, this, is, this should motivate you, spark you to say, I need to be baptized. So I can have that physical remembrance. Now, we all have it true if you're in Jesus Christ. If you're in Jesus Christ, you have been baptized. You have been baptized. You don't need to physically get dunked under water in order to have a relationship with God. That's an important step of obedience it's an ordinance for the church. We are to do that after we confess Jesus, believe in our heart, and we're saved. What should we do? We should be baptized to proclaim the gospel to the world. But you are baptized in Christ if you have said, I, I, I trust in you. I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I believe, Jesus, that your blood has paid the debt. Would you forgive me? You have been baptized in Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? What it means is, first of all, as we see in this text, you're baptized with him in his death. And by the way, I, I need to say that baptized or baptism just means immersed. Or actually, it also means submerged. Which is why we practice baptism by immersion. We really believe in the literal, you know, picture of what this word means. The word baptism means to be immersed, so we immerse. That's why we dunk the whole person underwater. Now, we're not legalistic about it. Some of you actually were here six, seven years ago when um, I, I point over here because that's where she always sat. Uh, Mrs. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Colgrove, right? She was, I don't know, 90 years old or so when, when she asked to be baptized because she was baptized as a baby and she didn't remember it. And she, she's like, but I, I feel like I need to be baptized because now I made a profession of faith. She had to get wheelchaired in every single day. We weren't going to make her climb up here and go into the steps. So we don't be legalistic about it. Like, no, no, you have to be immersed. You know, 90-year-old woman here, we're going we're gonna to take you and we're going to put you under the water. Like, no, no. We, we don't need to be legalistic about it. But, but I think the picture of the immersion speaks more powerfully. And so when at all possible, we immerse, right? Because I think that's the more accurate picture of what Jesus Christ did for us. Because we identify with Jesus' death and burial. What does that mean? What does it mean that we identify with it, right? We've got our cross up here. We see ourselves, Christian. Christian, we see ourselves on that cross with Jesus. Now, we don't do any work. We didn't do anything. Jesus took the pain for us. Jesus took the wrath of the Father for us. But we identify with Jesus. We say, my sins are being crucified. Jesus took my place. I should have been up there, but Jesus substituted himself for me instead. And then after he died, after he paid for it, what did he do? They took his body off the cross and they buried it. And our sins, our sins were up there and Jesus paid for our sins and then our sins are buried. They're buried in the ground, all of them. Jesus has paid for him completely. Colossians chapter 2 says that the Father nailed our sins to the cross. And when they're buried in the tomb, what happens when Jesus came out, when he was resurrected? They stay in there. The grave cloths, the grave clothes, they stayed in the tomb. And when Jesus came out, he was new. Just like that are we a new creation. So too we may walk in newness of life. So we identify with Jesus in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection. When we believe in Jesus, we are baptized in that way. And when you physically, and this is the beauty of the picture of the baptism, right? When you physically go down into that water, you're remembering, my sins are buried. And when I come out, I am a new creation. Like, like the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. That's what Jesus did for us. That's how we are to live now. So just like in communion, so we have in baptism. There is a remembrance and there is an application. There's a remembrance and there's an application. And this, this here in Romans 6 is more the individual remembrance and application. And we'll get to the corporate concept in 1 Corinthians. But I wanted us to, to look at here because I think this is the strong, personally, I think this is the strongest purpose and meaning of baptism that we have in the scriptures. But what does Paul do in the rest of the chapter of chapter 6? 
he goes on to detail how we should live because of our baptism. Because Jesus Christ has changed us, because Jesus Christ lives, we should walk in newness of life. Therefore, he says, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its desires. Don't be controlled by the effects of sin. Instead, be controlled by the Spirit of God. You're dead to sin, you're alive to God in Christ Jesus, as he says in verse 11. And so, some of you may, may need to take some time today, we all need to, let's face it, and look at Romans chapter 6. That would be a great application point. One of my application points is actually to memorize verse 4. But maybe read the whole encha- entire chapter today as a, as a devotional family or individual or otherwise. Take some time and read Romans chapter 6. It's really beautiful as to how we should both remember the gospel and apply the gospel. So in Romans, we see more the individual context of baptism, like I said. Of course, it it carries a lot of corporate uh, context to it as well. But in 1 Corinthians, we really dive into the corporate dynamic of baptism. And so here I want to offer us an illustration because I, um, I I like soccer, Right? Uh, or I should say, I like the real football. Uh, no, no offense. Actually, totally meaning to offend you, American football fans. Um, real, real football is, uh, is this. So, I mean, think about it, right? American football, how much do they actually use their feet besides running? 5% of the game, maybe, kickers and punters, the two most meaningless positions in football, right? Um, <laughs> American football, that is, right? I shouldn't say meaningless, but like, you know, I mean, nobody likes the kicker and the punter. Um, but real football, real football, they use their feet the whole game. All right, so, all right. Here's the, here's the fun thing about that, what I just said. I purposely did it just because I want you to come up to me and tell me how terrible of the, of the sermon it was based on that rather than God's word. I'll get more comments about my take on American football versus real football than I will about biblical theology. So, um, but in, in, in American football, I'll just call it soccer for everybody's temper, the, the, the situation down here. Um, in soccer, right, what, what do you start out doing? You start out, you know, five, six, seven-year-old. You get out in the field. You run around. You start out in the, in the corporate game, don't you? Typically, most people. I, I, that's how I started. You know, my parents put me in uh, recreational soccer, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, ten years old. And I enjoyed it. It was fun. I'd run around. Um, I was a little bit more, you know, in the game. But there was a lot of my teammates that would just be like sitting on their, on their you know, picking flowers, like, wee, let's throw them up in the air. You know, they're doing all sorts of stuff. They're twirling. You know, they're, they're talking to each other and laughing as the ball goes right by them. You know how it is as a parent. Like if you've got five, six, seven-year-olds playing soccer, you're like, oh, look at that. Okay, there, the ball went right by them. Okay, cool. You know, and it's a, you're learning the game, right? You're just learning how it's going to go. You're learning the ins and outs of soccer. You're, you're, you're learning how to kick the ball and how to, you know, watch the ball and, and things like that and move into space. You're learning the basics of the game. You're not really a soccer player at that point, right? I mean, you play soccer, but you're not identifying as a soccer player yet. You're learning. You're getting in the game. You're in the environment. You're in the context. But then something happens to some soccer players at some point. They, they make something of a commitment to say, okay, now I want to be a soccer player. I want to identify as someone who plays soccer. I, 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 this is part of my identity. This is who I am. So that means I'm going, to, I'm going to individually work on it. I'm going to train. I'm going to, I'm going to do all the things that soccer players do. I'm going to work at it. I'm going to get better. I'm going to practice. I'm going to train. I'm going to work hard. And at some point in time, you say, okay, this is, this is, I'm, this is for real now. I'm actually committing to this. Now, there's no perfect illustration, all right? But, th- but there's something of a, of a conversion experience, if you will, right? And then what happens? Not only individually do you work on your game and you, you get better and you grow, but if you, just, if you just do this all day for the rest of your life, are you a soccer player? No, because soccer is it's a team sport. You play as a team. And so the, 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 the dynamic of, of our baptism 
is that we are baptized, we remember it, we have individual benefit from it, right? We are saved and we have relationship with God and that is so good. That is so awesome. But now we are called into, we are baptized into application. And Paul says we are baptized into the body of Christ. And so let's jump into 1 Corinthians 12 to see what the corporate effect of baptism looks like. Now, in chapters 11 through 14 of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul gives us uh, a, specific, a very specific theme, and you might call it the body of Christ. That's the theme of chapters 11, 12, 13, and 14. I mean, you've got spiritual gifts. You've got, you know, talking about, you know, how do we pray and head coverings and, and the Lord's Supper, baptism, spiritual gifts, love, order in the church, and things of that nature. So how do we do life together is the idea of these chapters. And right in the beginning and middle of this section where the Apostle Paul is talking about life as the body of Christ, he gives us the two ordinances, the Lord's Supper and then baptism. So we've already talked about the Lord's Supper. You'll find that in chapter 11. He actually spends the majority of chapter 11 on that topic. And then in chapter 12, he starts out by introducing spiritual gifts. Verses 1 through 11. And here, I'd, I'd actually really enjoy going through it, but for the purpose of our message today, we're focusing in on baptism. So I'm just going to say three things about spiritual gifts. He, he, I, I, there's, a, there's a lot you could say about it. You could probably give 10 points on it, but I want to give three main points on spiritual gifts, which lead us up to the passage that we're going to talk about here in just a minute from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that Josh read. So there's three things in spiritual gifts. The first is this. They're given by God through the Holy Spirit. Spiritual gifts are given by God through the Holy Spirit to the church. It's according to his will, secondly. Verse 11, we see, if you've got your Bibles open, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11 says, One and the same Spirit is active in all of these, distributing to each person as he wills. And then the third point is that the purpose of these spiritual gifts is the common good. In other words, it's the building up of the body of Christ. It's the edification of the church. Because remember, that's his theme here. Throughout these, these four chapters, he's going to keep talking about the body of Christ, the body of Christ. So what is the body of Christ? What, what are we talking about? Are we talking about the literal, physical body of Jesus Christ? Let's, let's see what we're talking about. Verse 12, let's see. For just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many, are one body, so also is Christ. So he's giving us an illustration. We, we understand his, his metaphorical language here, right? For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Okay, so let's, let's process this a little bit. First, in verse 12, Jesus and his family, that's the church, right, are like a body. He gives us this illustration that he continues. If you look at verses 14 down really through the rest of the chapter, he talks about this language of the church being like a body, right? There's some eyes, there's some ears, there's some feet and hands and, and other parts of our bodies, he even talks about those private parts of your body and, and makes some observations there. And you can read through that about what that looks like and that means. But he says this, essentially the point of talking about the, the, the body is that although there are many parts, we have many parts of our bodies, we could, we could probably identify, you know, between 20 and 200 different parts of our bodies, whether external or internal as well, organs and whatnot. Although there's many parts of a body, we are one body. We are one body. There are many Christians, but we all have unique and different functions, and we bring different gifts and experiences. And that is good, and that's by design. That is good, and it's by design. Now look at this statement in verse 13. For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body. So what is the application of our baptism? What is the corporate effect? 
it's this. We become immersed into the body of Christ. When you, are, you are, when you are baptized in Jesus Christ, you are not just baptized into Jesus. You are baptized into the church. You are immersed into this group of people, the family of God. And now you have a new family. You have a new identity, a new heart. Everything's new. And it's, once again, it, as we see later in verse 13 here, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free, it's irrespective of social status, work status, ethnicity, experience, gifting, any kind of label you might want to put on somebody as a person, it is, God is no respecter of persons. Anyone and everyone can be a part of the body of Christ. And everyone and everyone is equally valued by God in the body of Christ. Where else in society do you have that? As long as sinful man is at work, you don't see that anywhere else. So what is it that unites us? What is it that unites us? It's the Spirit of God. Look at, verse, at the end of verse 13. We were all given one spirit to drink. What, what is, what is your, your body mostly made up of? Water. The Spirit of God goes in and through every part of the body. Every individual part of the body has the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is what unites us. He's the one that moves in us and works through us for the good of the body and for the good of the world so that they might be grafted into the body. Our baptism points to this. When we're immersed into Jesus Christ, we are immersed. There's a corporate effect. We're immersed in the body of Christ. And so there's three things that I want to bring out as it relates to the corporate effects of baptism. Uh, first, when you are baptized into Christ, you become part of the body of Christ. This is what we've been saying. It's like, and, and you could say, well, okay, yeah, body is one illustration. You could also use the illustration of a family, right? I think the, the family illustration is, is very akin to the body. Right? There's different family members, there's different types of family members, but they're all the family. They all have different functions, they all have different roles. Some are the parents, some are the child, some are the sibling, some are the aunt, the uncle, the nephew, niece, but they're all a family. You could also use this, the illustration of a soccer team, which I like. You know, Everybody wants to be the striker. I want to be the one to score the goals, but if you don't have a good defense, right? You know, you're not going to win too many games. So you need the whole body, the whole team in that illustration to work together. And then, of course, Jesus Christ is our general manager, coach, and uh, trainer, and everything else. So when you're baptized into Christ, you become part of the body of Christ. That's really important for us to remember because I think here, we, I, I've talked to so, so many, and it, and it breaks my heart to, to hear people say, well, I know Jesus, and so I'm good. I, I have a relationship with God. I don't need the church. I don't really like the church. Come on, some of you have thought that before, <laughs> right? Some of you have had that thought. I don't really want to be a part of the church. Those people are crazy, right? And, and you know what? We kind of are, <laughs> right? Who doesn't, who doesn't have a, a bad day every now and then or maybe every day, right? And I, and I say that with a smile on my face, but it's also, it's also a sobering reality. And we'll talk about it a little bit at the end. But first, you're baptized into Christ, you become part of the body of Christ. But secondly, when you're baptized into Christ, you are called to use your gifts for the good of the other members of the body of Christ. And this is what I love to see about We in the Community Church. I love seeing all of you say, oh, you know, I can do this. And then someone else says, I can't do that, but I can do this. And then someone else says, I can't do either of those things, but I can do this. And the spirit and the heart in this church is, is such that you understand that we're all made uniquely and individually. And we all have unique roles and unique gifts to give to one another and bless one another by. I mean, how many parents in here are so glad that there's a space for your children to, to, to learn about God in a way that's meaningful to them? Because if they listen to me for a half hour, well, half hour, yeah, right, hour, um, they'd be falling asleep, right? Which is okay, too. That's fine. You know, I, I think there's some, some great merit to having children in the worship service as well. And, of course, our, our older uh, teens and whatnot are here. But, um, 
right? We're thankful for the ministries that provide. How many of you are thankful for the worship team, right? Yeah, amen, right? I mean, you know, and the, and the elders and the ministry leaders, and we could just go on and on. You know, men's group, so blessed, you know, by men's group these last number of weeks. The women's group, the, the Thursday studies that we do. I mean, so many people that are giving in different, unique ways, you know, and you think about, like, you know, the outreach that the Tilsons lead uh, to Open Door Mission once a month, right? It's just different people serving in so many different ways. And then there's all the organic ways in which you serve that nobody even sees or notices. Those might be the most beautiful of all. So we, we use our gifts for the good of the members of the body of Christ. Look at chapter 12, verse 7. A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. And then he, then he details from verses 8 through 10 what that looks like. Message of wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, performing miracles, prophecy, distinguishing of spirits, different kinds of tongues, interpreting of tongues. And then other, other passages in Scripture will give other listings of gifts, which makes us wonder, do we even know what all the spiritual gifts are? Did, did, did the Apostle Paul and the others, did they, did they write and they, did they include all of the spiritual gifts? Or are there spiritual gifts that aren't specifically listed? I don't know if we know that. I don't know if we know the question to that. So we use our spiritual gifts for the, the benefit of the members of the church. And that is directly, Paul directly links it to our baptism here. That's the theme. The central theme is that we are baptized by the Spirit into one body. So our baptism has a corporate effect. And then lastly, uh, when you are baptized into Christ, you are called to pursue love. I think we're all, I shouldn't say we're all, but all of you who've been in the Christian church for at least uh, a few months or, or a year or more, or if you've been to a Christian wedding, uh, you know what chapter 13 is about. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is often called the love chapter. For good reason. It's probably the most descriptive chapter that we have, a section of scripture on what love is. And it's a beautiful list. Love is patient, kind, does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking, it's not irritable, does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And Paul's point here is he's saying, okay, the gifts, the spiritual gifts are good, like, let's, let's rejoice in those that we've been given spiritual gifts. Let's use those spiritual gifts. But he says, make no mistake about it. Don't overly emphasize your gifts at the expense of love. Because essentially, he says, love is greater. If you've, if you've got to choose, now, ideally, you do both. But if you've got to choose, choose love. Because love is the greatest. Love is the best. It's the best expression because that is Jesus Christ himself. He is love, and that's, that's his most pure commandment. I shouldn't say most pure. They're all very, very pure. But that is maybe the, the foundational command of Jesus Christ for his church. Right? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. As Jesus loved us, so we are to love one another. And so our baptism, we are baptized into Jesus Christ. We are made new. We are completely new in Jesus Christ. And in that newness, we continue to, to experience that with each other as the body of Christ. And, and that is both beautiful and challenging, isn't it? So here's the thing. And this, and this is why people leave churches and don't come back. Because being a part of the body of Christ is messy. It's, it's messy when you have a head that gives freedom to each part of the body, right? Think about your body, right? Your, your brain controls your body, right? The reason why I'm moving the way I am, the way I'm speaking the way I am, is because my brain is controlling my body. My brain is, is thank God, fully functioning, and so I have complete control over my body. But Jesus... He has complete control, but he, he allows the different parts of the body to function as they will. 
Could you imagine that? Could you imagine? And actually, this, there, there is actually real medical conditions where people don't have control of parts of their body. And it's, and it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a sad thing. I don't know if you've ever seen like videos or, or if you've seen that before. It's actually very so sobering that people actually can't control their body. And, you know, I, and not to, I mean, we have to be very, you know, thoughtful here, but that's, that's a picture of the church, isn't it? In, in some way. There's no perfect illustration here, but Jesus is the head. He's the authority over the church, right? But then he gives, he gives ownership to the church. He's like, all right, finger, you can do what you, do what you want. Pinky, you can do what you want. And what do the finger and the pinky do? They, they don't always work together at grabbing things correctly. Sometimes the pinky says, I want to grab things like this. <laughs> and then the finger says, I, I, wanna, I don't want to point this way. And, and the body sometimes doesn't always work the way we ought to. And there's, there's, there's struggle and there's tension, there's, there's, there's challenge there. It's messy and it's chaotic at times, isn't it? Look around, church. <laughs> That's what we are, right? We, we are not a perfected body yet. We are a sanctifying body. Jesus is working on us, making us to be more and more unified wanting to see us grow into our identity in Jesus Christ. This is what we have. We have a head, Jesus Christ, that graciously and tenderly seeks to turn our focus from what we want to what he wants. We have a head who says, okay, finger and pinky, let's, let's see what we can do here. Let's, let's, let's work together. Let's focus on the good of the body and the glory of God. And that's a beautiful thing. And so our baptism, church, our baptism speaks both individually and corporately. And so I just want to encourage and challenge you in two different ways today. Um, excuse me. First, remember your baptism. Remember the gospel. Meditate on it often. Church, the gospel is your life. The gospel is our life. It's our, it's our source. It's our everything. It's Jesus Christ. It's it's what he did for us. It's his amazing love for us. Never deviate from the gospel. Never allow your mind and your heart, your motives, your intentions, your whatever, to get in the way of what is true in Jesus Christ. And that can happen in any number of ways. How many, how many times have I heard people say, I'm just no good. How could God love me? I gotta remember the gospel. We've got to remember the gospel. The reality is, is that you're no good, but that God does love you, despite the fact that you're no good, which means that you're very, very valuable. God thinks very highly of you to the point that he was willing to die for you. That's amazing, church. So remember the gospel because it's your life. Everything hinges on the gospel. It is for you. Live in it. Live in the truth of it. And so specifically, not just remember your baptism, remember the gospel. If you want to get a specific application today, I'd, I'd encourage you to read Romans chapter 6. I mean, read the whole book of Romans. But if that's a little bit too big of a pill to swallow today, chapter 6 at least, right? That would be a, a, an encouragement to you today. And then secondly, live it out intentionally. How can you apply the gospel today? How can you apply the gospel this week? Whether that's in an individual context, what does it look like for you individually to seek out application of the gospel? Or maybe some of you are like, I really need to think about that corporate dynamic. I really need to think about how, how am I serving the body of Christ? How am I loving the body of Christ? How am I walking in the love of Jesus Christ with other believers? Because life is messy, it's complex, it's challenging, but we're called to pursue peace and love one another. That's the calling. And so we come to this baptism. I was hoping to transition to a baptism, but that's okay because uh, some of you are like, hey, that's not bad. We got some extra time today. Um, shame on you for thinking that. Uh, I'm kidding. No, um, no it's, uh, obviously we would have loved to have uh, Anthony be baptized today, but, um, but this, let's just close. Uh, well, we're going to close in a, in a song so you guys can come up and get ready to, to lead us in that song. But let's close by meditating on and thinking about either our personal baptism 
or, or just the gospel truths itself. And, and if you're thinking about your baptism, you're thinking about the gospel truths and how Jesus so graciously saved you. And then maybe take this time of meditation and this time of singing and think about how can I apply the gospel today? What does that look like for me to apply the gospel? Maybe I need to just remember and, and meditate on it and maybe just allowing the Holy Spirit of God to work in me organically. Because maybe if you're like me and sometimes critical thinking um, and, and unique and application is, comes hard to you, let the Holy Spirit of God impress, impress it upon your heart. All right, let's pray, and then we'll, um, we'll sing our final song. God, we thank you for your incredible love for us in Jesus Christ. We give you praise that you saved us sinners. You are so gracious. You're so good. We give you praise for your mercy that even though we deserved wrath, we deserved your anger, we deserved to be under your judgment and condemnation. God, you were willing to, to send your very son to take that for us. Lord God, I pray that you would just allow us in this moment to remember how good you are, to remember how gracious you are, to remember how beautiful you are, to remember your amazing works and thoughts towards us. So God, we thank you for these things, and I pray that we would just live out radically and passionately. God, take our hearts, mold them into your image, conform us to your ways. God, give us wisdom and clarity and understanding at how to live forward, live according to the truth of the gospel, our baptism. So we thank you, we praise you for all these things. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.